let's go back to the day that you found out. Mm. What's the first thing that went through your mind? Am I gonna die? I, I really thought I was gonna die. Growing up, no one ever mentioned HIV to me. Like, it wasn't in the schools. It wasn't a conversation held at home. Like I said, I grew up, I'm Latino. I grew up in a Catholic household. And we're in Texas, it's an abstinence-only state. And so that conversation wasn't had with me or many of my peers. Do you think in this community that there is an HIV crisis? Oh, yeah. I, we, it's a crisis. Yeah, it's a crisis. Right now, the number one group getting infected disproportionately are young gay and bisexual men known as men who are sexy with men, 24 and younger. I could have avoided this, you know? I never had any classes that taught me to protect myself or anything. This was all just coming from my parents. Because they kind of gave me a whole talk that if you're gay, you're going to get AIDS. And that stigma is so alive and thriving here in the valley. My name is Paola Ramos, and this is Latinx. The word Latinx has been given a lot of different meanings in the media, but at its core, it stands for all the people within the Latino community who struggle to fit into one identity, which covers a lot. In this series, we aim to document the most pressing racial, political, sexual, and cultural issues facing one of America's fastest growing demographics. So we're here at the U.S.-Mexico border, and Brownsville, where we are, is one of the 34 permanent checkpoints. And what you see is this, right? You see a blend of two cultures, two identities, two languages, two countries. Brownsville itself is 90% Latino. A lot of people, a lot of immigrants come here knowing exactly what they're stepping into. They have hopes and dreams, ambitions. The one thing they don't know is that in Brownsville, in this entire region, there's a huge HIV epidemic, particularly among the Latino community. The Rio Grande Valley is one of the most politically contentious regions in the country. It also happens to be a place where HIV is affecting increasing numbers of queer Latinos. According to the CDC, HIV diagnosis declined in the U.S. from 2011 to 2015. Yet rates of new HIV infections for Latino men who have sex with men have increased. In the Rio Grande Valley specifically, 85% of people who contract HIV are Latino, and 75% of new cases are male. But why? We wanted to meet some of the people being affected by this crisis and learn more about the unconventional means they are using to do something about it. Joe Valles, also known as Beatrix Lestrange, started a program called Drag Out HIV in 2017 to use drag as a platform to confront social stigma head on. Hi. Hola. Hola. My name is Joe Colon Uvayas. I am a community organizing coordinator for Valley AIDS Council, and I am also drag activist Beatrix Lestrange. So I feel like in, in Brownsville, se, se respira la cultura latina, right? Yes, especially here in downtown Brownsville. On one end, you have the international bridge that goes into Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then here, you have all the little Mexican restaurants, like family-owned. Yeah, literally, tacos on every corner. Tacos on every corner. <laughs> if you come to Brownsville, Texas, yes. you will have tacos in every corner. <laughs> no, that's something I love about the city. It's like, I feel like every corner we turn into, it's like a celebration of our culture. Especially even here downtown, like even in terms of religion and faith and spirituality. Yeah. Like you'll have like the immaculate, like the cathedrals, and then you have like the yerberias, the botanicas, the more spiritual spaces that are based on like traditional Mexican folk healing. So there's like literally a little bit for everyone here. So this is where I live, this okay. is my building. There are so many people that are dedicated to helping our community here in the Valley, but I feel like there definitely is a crisis, especially because in communities of color, if you're queer, bisexual, your risk for HIV is significantly higher because those are the communities that don't have access to proper sexual education or access to reproductive health care or health insurance, you know, facing all these kinds of barriers that essentially prevent them from even knowing how to take care of themselves. I've had situations where I've had younger people coming in to get tested who don't even know what the term vagina is at a young age, but they are still having sex, right? So um, it's that bad. <laughs> What's the story behind Drag Out HIV? How was it born? 
Drag at HIV was kind of born out of the work that I had been doing in the community. You know, what if we do this kind of program where we get to train other drag queens to do what I do, teach them that like drag can be more than just nightlife. Once we put the call out, we recruited a series of nine drag queens and then those nine queens were given the opportunity to participate in like four different trainings and workshops to learn about different issues affecting the valley. The dragtivist work is essentially the same thing as the work as a tester or someone who's doing risk reduction in our offices. It's just in a way that's a little bit more accessible for people. I had already been doing like organizing events for different nonprofits. Pretty much like a year into that, someone from Valley AIDS Council reached out because um, they were interested in hosting a series of RuPaul's Drag Race viewing parties, but with the intention of having testing staff on site and do like a community outreach event at the same time. And they were basically looking for someone to host and that's how I met Oscar Lopez. When I first started doing this work, I was borderline homeless, didn't really have a lot going on. I don't have a degree, but he definitely saw something in me and he definitely gave me that opportunity. We're going to the Valley AIDS Clinic to get a sense of what is causing the HIV epidemic here in this region, no? in the Rio Grande Valley, to understand why Latinas are predominantly affected by this. One of the first things that you notice is that there's no signage at all that this is an AIDS clinic. There's no evidence whatsoever in the streets that you're walking into an AIDS clinic. We have to be discreet about who we are to protect our clients. So Westbrook Clinic is the name of the, the clinics that uh -huh. we operate. And that's because just having the words HIV or SIDA or, or AIDS on anything. Scare people. Yeah, scares people. Mm -hmm. It makes them worry about who will see them coming in here. When you say here, where are we? Like, what, what, what are we seeing right now? So this is our largest of all of our sites, of our three sites. So we have an in-house pharmacy, we have in-house x-rays, in-house dentists, in-house mental health care and therapy. We developed it that way because we learned the hard way that when we referred them out to other clinics, other doctors, inevitably somebody would notice them that recognized them through a family member or somebody would accidentally out them or even in some cases purposely do so. Um, just out of ignorance. But we're working to, to make a difference, to change things, to make it better. Oscar grew up in the Rio Grande Valley and has been working in the public health field since the AIDS crisis of the 1980s. HIV affected me personally because when I was living here in the Rio Grande Valley, it was when we first started to see people die from AIDS-related causes. My job then was to offer condoms to go out to the community to get people to take care of their, their themselves and their health. But my job also after work was to recover the bodies after they died because the funeral homes wouldn't bury them. So that forever changed who, who I became. And have you noticed a difference since 30 years ago? Is this still the same Rio Grande Valley that you saw back then or have things changed? In a lot of ways, and a lot of unfortunate ways, it's still the same in terms of the homophobia, the stigma of the disease, people afraid to tell their family members, um, the, the way women are treated and, and, and not respected, and, and the machismo. Do you think in this community that there is an HIV crisis, particularly among Latino men? Oh yeah, uh, we, it's a crisis. Yeah, it's a crisis. Right now, the number one group getting infected disproportionately are young gay and bisexual men, known as men who are sexed with men, 24 and younger. This does impact women, but I want people to realize that our Latino men are disproportionately infected by HIV. Here for the Valley, for example, one out of every four young Latino males will become HIV positive in their lifetime within the next two years. So religion is obviously such a big part of Latino culture, right? Even walking down this hall, you see crosses. Oh, I see Virgen Maria right behind me. So it's, it's, it's present. How does religion, how would you say religion is playing a role in sort of fomenting these, these stigmas? It continues to perpetuate that the norm is wait till you get married, uh, that being heterosexual is ideal, that anything else than heterosexual is an abomination, you're bringing a disgrace upon the family. Do they associate being, at least in Latino culture, being queer with having HIV? Yeah, that one equals the other. So it is gay, tiene sida. Exactly. 
and you get what you deserve for, for breaking all those rules that you know our family does not. Take a listen to your stomach. You know, stomach issues, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, no. stomach pains or anything. No. And appetite's good? Appetite's amazing. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, my name is Michael. I'm 26. I've lived here my entire life. I've been positive for about three years, going on three years. This is June. Did you tell people immediately or did you wait? No, I waited about two days because I let it settle in with myself first. I, I made peace with it first before I told anybody and the first person I told was my best friend. Mm -hmm. Then the second person I told was my mom. Did you tell your father? I told him, yeah, he was the third person I told him. And they felt like failures because they had like warned me because they kind of gave me a whole talk that if you're gay, you're gonna get AIDS. And that it would all come down to this. Would you say among Latino gay men and Latino bisexual men, um, do you think people are taking care of themselves? Do you think people take the steps to come um, to these clinics? I don't think everybody does. Why? I mean, some people are scared to run into somebody they know I mean, I, I would sometimes feel scared. I would, I would be scared to come over to the clinic because I'd be scared to see somebody I knew. And I wouldn't want them to think anything of me or he's having sex or anything. Are people open about their HIV status? Are people even open about their, the fact that they're gay? There are a few people who are open about their HIV status, but that's very few. There's not a lot of people that I know that are positive. But I assume that there's, they're out there, you know. Brownsville is a place steeped in Latino culture. And I can see why many Latinos feel at home here. But then there's the undeniable machismo. And while stigma surrounding queer identity and HIV isn't always obvious, it's still felt by many in the community. Usted, ¿qué piensa de, de los Latinos gays que, que hay aquí? No tengo nada contra ellos, ¿verdad? Pero creo que este, sí estoy en contra de, de, su, de sus prácticas, ¿verdad? ¿De que ellos hagan el amor? Pienso que no, que no deben de tener. ¿Ok? ¿Sí? Punto. O sea, la gente sabe que hay una epidemia. O sea, la gente sabe el problema, sabe las consecuencias, sabe los daños colaterales, pero se sordea, o sea, no lo quieren aceptar, no lo quieren ver por la idiosincrasia. Pero la realidad es que ahí está y existe y si te pega, te destruye. I wanted to know more about what it's like to be queer in the valley. Sebastian, who's also known as Luna Lestrange, started using drag less than a year ago as a way to empower the community through education. So now, where are we driving towards? Right now, we're going to my grandma's. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're going, just going to have like breakfast, I guess. Are they, do they know about Luna? Yes. As you were growing up, how did you identify? Were you when queer? I, were you straight? Most of the time, like when I was growing up, I couldn't understand because it was bad to like boys. Like I was always used to liking girls. Okay. So then when was the moment that you decided to stop hiding that stuff? After I came back from the army. Like okay, after, so you were at the army too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then I was like, you know what dude, like, I don't need to hide who I am. Especially because after I came back like three, four months later, I started doing drag. So what do you feel like when you put on drag? When I put on like Luna, it's like a whole process. Because at first it's still Sebastian there, still a little boy underneath. But as soon as I transform into Luna, I feel like so much power. It's an amazing idea to talk about the issues in drag because people are going to listen. They want to hear what this big monster has to say, you know? That way? So you've always had a, you've always been close. Is that how you would describe your relationship? Very, very close. Yeah. It's kind of like we're like stuck together from like the <laughs> Yeah, I'm like a big mama's boy. It's just a bond yeah. that we have. 
And Erica, you know, in, in a lot of Latino families, there's always this expectation, right, that the son, no, que tiene que ser un macho, right, that they have to sort of grow up to be these, these very, exactly, these machos. Is that sort of the vision you had of, of Sebastian when he was a kid? No. It was like, whatever makes him happy is going to make me happy. And do you think that's something that most Latino families think? No. Y en la cultura de uno mexicano siempre es de que, no, es el varón, tiene que ser hombre y tiene que ser las reglas como eran la, para atrás. Pero en la actualidad yo pienso que lo mejor es lo que él le haga feliz, me va a hacer a mí feliz. ¿Y no hay salsa, verdad, ma? Le echa de menos vivir con él. ¿Sí? Sí, pues ya no lo quiero. <risa> ¿Cómo era vivir con, con, con Sebastián? Mugrero, cuando me hacía drag. Uh, yeah. Yeah. ¿Y han ido con él a, a drag out HIV? Have you been there with him? No. Nunca. No. They've yeah. never seen me perform. I was cause like it's at night and they're like morning people. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yo le he dicho, vamos vuela. Vamos vuela. Ah no, está bueno. Otro día. Nada más con el. O sea que algún día se va a ir. Sí, un día. Okay. Sí. Okay. Ustedes entienden el el impacto que está teniendo sí. lo que él está haciendo. Sí. sí. ¿Cómo notan que está afectando a la comunidad? Es algo que cuando yo tenía la edad de él hace 20 años para atrás muy normal. Antes no, no se hablaba. Um, mi tío murió de eso. Oh. El hermano de ella. Y no nos dimos ¿verdad? cuenta hasta cuando estaba en el hospital uh -huh. que él tenía HIV y que él tenía una doble vida. Y, ¿Usted, y usted sabía que, que él era... Él, él se identificaba como un hombre homosexual o, o siempre lo...? No, como normal. Él, su esposa y todos tuvieron un hijo. Y el, you hijo, that, the perfect marriage. el hijo uh -huh. lo rechazó ya de grande. Yo a mi hermano lo cuidé. ¿verdad? Este... Me decían, ay, que no, que no, toques este, que no toques el otro. Y pobrecito, él la fuerza quería darle a uno el beso, así, pues todos nos decían los enfermeras que no, que porque nos iba a pegar a nosotros. Él. Ustedes, ¿no? Habiendo vivido esta experiencia, like, ¿cómo se puede cambiar eso? Se puede cambiar en la manera como estamos yo y Sebastián. Uh -huh. Hablar un poco más con la gente, abrirles más un poco la mentalidad. Eh, de, como dicen, del machismo. Y si, y si todos ponemos un poquito, se habla de esto, aquí, allá, donde quiera, es claro que va a haber un cambio. So we're in McAllen, which is actually one of the poorest cities of America. But it's in this most unexpected background that we're about to go to Drag Out HIV, which is a party that brings together the community to empower them, to motivate them, and to inspire them to get tested. I do expect this to be more than just a party and actually a space where really important conversations are taking place. How long does it take to, to go through this whole process? Sandra Beatrix face takes like an hour. <laughs> and if I have time, I'll like go and do detailed work. But stuff like Drag Out HIV is like a passion project. So I want to make sure that I try to look my best, but I also want to make sure that I make time for all the other stuff, like running the show and making sure the queens are on time and making sure the DJ's on time and making sure the space is comfortable for the queens and that everyone has what they need. So tell me a little bit about what happens outside of this room. It's, what is one walking it's into? It's a fun way to do HIV outreach and prevention. There, okay. I mean, essentially that's what it is because people feel so much more confident or they let down their wall when they see a drag performer because sometimes being in an office, in a clinic, seeing all these like sexual health messages, that can be like overwhelming for people. But if you're at a bar, it just makes it so much easier for people to process. And even if you're not here for the activist part of it, at least you're seeing a drag show. But hopefully you left with something more than just, this is just a drag show. While many Latinos who are HIV positive are still hesitant to talk publicly about it, I met one person living with the disease who was willing to speak up about the challenges and barriers he faced. My name is Adrian Castellanos. People call me Aiden. I'm 25 years old. I'm from the Rio Grande Valley. I'm an intersectional activist and I'm HIV positive. These are all kind of taken at different times. This is after I found out. What, what went through your mind? How did you find out? So I had been sick a few months leading up to before I found out. And it got to the point where one day I got home from work and I collapsed at home. Like I just, I 
couldn't walk anymore. And my mom found me. And so she drove me to the hospital. And the next day the doctor came in, he kind of like paused for a second and I was like, what's going on? And he said, you have a positive for HIV. But he said, your HIV has progressed. So we're diagnosing you with AIDS. Basically my immune system was shutting down. Like I was on my way out. Why do you think it took you so long to know that you were HIV positive? Yeah, the health literacy level in the area, and I think just in the state in general, it's really low. These conversations aren't happening. On top of that, this is a really poverty-stricken area. And so I couldn't afford to take time off of work to go and get tested. For a lot of people, I think everywhere, but especially in this area, a lot of people, it's either, do you want to be able to put food at the end of the day or just continue being sick and hopefully deal with it later. Explain to me how exactly how you're turning this experience right in your journey into empowering other people. You know, I, I've been really fortunate to have a really strong support system. You know, my family is on board and I'm able to say like, yeah, I'm HIV positive and I'm gay and I've been through these things and I'm still here. But I know that not everybody is lucky to have that. And so that's kind of why I, do the work that I do and I put myself out in such a public way because we need to, we need to have that conversation. It wasn't happening before, so I'm gonna do it. How's everyone doing? Yeah? Make some noise for all the queens from check out HIV. So first of all, one who knows your status, raise your hand. If you don't know your status or if you've been questioning your status because maybe you hooked up with someone or, you know, whatever happened, our team at Valley AIDS Council is here for you. Wait, who here is on PrEP? <gasps> PrEP is a pill that you take once a day that helps prevent you from becoming infected with HIV if you are exposed. So if you didn't know that, now you do. And so the thing is, even if this message isn't for you tonight, take it home to someone that you know, because maybe they need to hear it from someone close to them. Maybe you're that person tonight. So again, thank you guys so much for being here. Who's ready for some fucking drag? Make some noise. Come on, Miss Secret in my house. When you're queer, brown, and Latinx, you're constantly made to feel like you need to apologize for it. And doing drag, it's your way of taking all that power back and not having to apologize for who you are. To me, your clinic is present everywhere in the Valley. Is that something that you imagined 30 years ago, that this clinic could become such an important support system for so many beyond these walls? Back then, there was no chance to imagine because we were just about saving who we could and burying who had passed. But I do believe that there is a greater purpose for us and what we're doing now. And what we're seeing is all these wonderful, young, empowered individuals. They've got their own support groups. They've got their own organizations up and running. And we have to, as a community as a whole, support the LGBT community on the U.S.-Mexican border so that we can survive. And we will survive if everybody gets the hell out of their house, stops being afraid, stops being embarrassed, and get tested. Just open up that little door, let us in. We'll take care of the rest. So make some noise for all these entertainers tonight. My name is Beatrix of Strange. It's been a pleasure and an honor being here, sharing this space. Remember, you guys are loved, you are important, you matter. Get tested, know your status. Thank you for being a part of this journey. It's been a pleasure. Peace. From the outside, the stats, the stigma, the culture, point to an HIV epidemic that sees no hope. But the second that you actually step into this town, you realize that the Valley is actually at the forefront of change. And that's because there's a group of Latinx that are using the most unconventional platform to change people's minds, right? To open people's eyes. So I, I do feel optimistic about the way that the Valley will continue to be at the forefront of change.